offering. And then it was rapid prototyping. Um, so we were looking at sort of model making and, and you know understanding the technology, but that was sort of back in 2003. So it's very nearly 20 years we've sort of been engaged with this. Um, but 3D concrete printing, as, as, as Mo said, we uh, were lucky enough to get a, a significant grant um, in the mid 2000s and that allowed us to sort of explore um, the large scale technology. So what, uh, what, what I'm going to do today is uh, tell you a, a little bit about 3D concrete printing as, as the technology itself. Um, I want to just sort of show, and I'm sure many, many colleagues are aware of, of, of sort of how widespread it's become, but give you some examples of what, what it's been useful and the scale and, and, and the in interest. Um, move on to perhaps some new developments that particularly we've been working on here uh, at Loughborough and then sort of to have a have a have a think about where we are with the technology and, and how it might fit into the wider sort of net zero challenges you know reducing embodied carbon in buildings and looking at perhaps uh, how how the technology can impact sort of circularity and, and ideas around you know reuse of components and things um, and then hopefully that will be 15 20 minutes or so um, probably obviously I've said 15 20 minutes probably be longer than that because uh, you know how these things go but we'll have some time for some Q&A afterwards so um, I, I borrowed this slide from a, from a colleague uh, for, who some of you may know um, Alistair Gibb who liked to show this um, and we know that construction um, perhaps has not developed as fast as some of the sectors, you know, in terms of, you know, our uh, um, our cars, phone technology, these have all changed out of sight in, in the last decade. Whereas sort of construction generally is, is very, is, is remains very, very similar and our values associated with it are, are very similar. But we also know we've got many problems in construction. We have problems over productivity. Um, having consistency and quality of what we're manufacturing uh, and what we're producing, cost and time overruns associated with products, um, as well as increasingly obviously understanding and reducing the impact of the buildings over the life, the environmental impact, the, the contribution to CO2 emissions, etc. It's a really tough space and I think naturally we look to other manufacturing, uh, other sectors to understand where we can learn and, may, and maybe do things better. And, and, and sort of automation in the automotive sector is one of those areas that we that we we always tend to lean on. Um, I, li I like this image. This is this is from uh, uh, Jaguar's sort of fully automated um, manufacturing facility um, uh, 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 over Birmingham way. Um, and I think it's easy for us to think what we want is automated systems so we can build buildings you know we can do it all automatically but i think i think these things are largely um are largely unrealistic you know what we've got are um we've got to move from a very a completely craft hand-based sector to one where we're able to to leverage automation um in, in production of the components and the construction where where it makes a lot of sense and and i think the you know the myth is that you know cars are not actually fully automated in terms of manufacturing you know if you go to the plant there are many people doing lots of jobs in between um so robotics and automation are deployed where it makes sense and people are deployed where it makes sense and i think that this is this is exactly what we're going to end up with construction going forward the challenge is to you know find out what technologies and how we can uh, use automation to its best advantage and this is, i think is where 3d concrete printing sort of fits into the overall scheme um, now i did have some lovely videos for you uh, but obviously powerpoint uh, would not allow me to run my presentation for more than about three minutes with the videos in so i've taken some stills instead um, but Concrete printing is an additive manufacturing process and an additive manufacturing process is one that uh, doesn't require a mould. So traditionally, if we want to shape a material, we often have it liquid in some form. We create a container which we put the stuff in, it sets, we remove the mould and we have the shape that we want. 
obviously from a circularity point of view and a, and a waste stream those moles are what do produce a waste stream so the benefit is where we can reuse those moles so it becomes very effective if we've got hot you know very many of the same parts being wanting to be made and it's the same in manufacturing as it's the same in construction and typically if we do have you know interesting bespoke systems uh wall facades you know there's a big engineering effort to uh, engineer those down to the minimum number of moles that we need to repeat so that you can get uh, you know get better value per part out of, out of the moles um, so this is you know in a sense a little bit constraining because there is this big re-engineering process there's always a cost associated with something that's not flat and rectilinear um, uh, and you do produce a mold particularly when we use molds as shuttering in construction projects where you know you are using timber for maybe one or two castings and then they will get thrown away and there'll be fresh timber so you generate a waste stream so additive manufacturing you work from a, a digital model which you can create then you use software to break that model down into a series of machine instructions that guides um, either the placement of material directly so in the concrete printing image uh, which is the bottom uh, right hand corner here we've got a, a wet mortar that's extruded into a nozzle and then a robotic system or a gantry positioning system moves that nozzle around positioning the system uh, positioning the material that's built up in layers and so you can then a layer at a time build up the facsimile if you like of your digital model it's all material dependent and if you look at rapid prototyping or, or other rapid manufacturing uh, processes such as stereolithography which is the one on the the, le the left hand side left hand image there you've got um, a vat of liquid and it's a photosensitive resin and the thing that moves is the ultraviolet laser which then solidifies the material selectively and here you have a build table that sort of slowly sinks into a liquid back, uh, vat to create your three three-dimensional object the advantages of these things are that you have relative freedom over the shapes that you want. So the manufacturing process is a fairly co low cost profile. It's the, the production of the digital model, the running of the machine, the amount of material gives you the cost of the part. The geometry effectively is for free. Um, and where you can leverage that, you generally can get a uh, benefit. And it's the same in manufacturing, and it's the same in construction. Although construction does have an interesting element to it where we're building houses um, and, and walls of stuff on site, which you don't find in manufacturing. But for off-site sort of processes, there are three principal uh, methods. Um, if you're interested in the framework for this, there's some international work uh, through Rylam um, that we did with uh, colleagues. Uh, looked at a process classification framework which the reference is on the top there for those who are interested but essentially you can mix up sand cement water uh, and other things to create a mortar that mortar is extruded and a machine will extrude that in situ which is this one on the right so extrusion based jetting is really where we're spraying concrete very much like shotcrete, although that you are spraying on top of wet concrete rather than on a hard surface, but the positioning is done much the same way as the extrusion. And out of interest, the material that the extrusion is based on is actually based on shotcrete type uh, mix designs. The other method that's different is particle bed, and here what you do is lay down um, consecutive layers of, in this case, sand in thin layers which in this case is about 10 millimeters and then you inject some sort of binder to make it solid so you end up with your object caked in loose material which you can take out now there's lots of variations of these there's different binders used in particle bed there's larger aggregates that have been used there's an increased use obviously with extrusion not just mortars which is small aggregates but starting to use larger extrusions with bigger aggregates in um, because obviously one of one of the snags is that the extrusion process means you have quite cement rich materials perhaps with twice the amount of carbon uh, emissions associated with it as conventional concretes so you want to minimize that um, and one way of doing so is to actually increase the aggregates so that you can minimize the paste amount so in a lot of volume um, applications 
uh, there are there are more concretes being used. There are also other processes that are largely based on these um, uh, and, ver and variations of them. I mentioned before we got two principal sort of applications. One is on site and that is largely extruding the walls of buildings. So it is extrusion. It's just you have got more material, thicker layers, generally 70 millimetres by 70 millimetres, and you are drawing around the uh, two skins of the wall, which will be filled with insulation. Lots of buildings being built and other things with these large gantry systems. Um, and obviously some of the benefits here may not be first cost necessarily, although there's increasing uh, uh, belief and argument that actually you are saving costs doing this, but also things like health and safety on site um, and, and, and quality. So doing things like this means that you rethink the production process. So if this was in the UK and we were doing brick walls, you would be needing to rely on small gangs of bricklayers, you would have to have uh, de constant deliveries of mortars coincided with the brickwork, you would have to have scaffolding in there, health and safety inspections, and, and, and a bigger team supporting the installation of the walls. However, with a, with a frame, you've got a much smaller team, no need for scaffold, etc. So you can sort of simplify the process. So some really interesting stuff coming out of, you know, where these benefits are quite often there, they're over a larger, uh, uh, it's sort of a whole process approach where you can see the benefits. On site, uh, sorry, off site fabrication is where we're building bits of buildings, like this big column next to my colleague Jerry here. Um, the really exciting thing is that additive manufacturing is now a modern, uh, recognised modern method of construction. And these two applications here speak to all of the range where you're dealing with off site prefabrication, right to augmenting on site um, operations. And it's been used extensively worldwide. So, you know, we are seeing full scale buildings and large buildings being built either with on site methods or with off site fabrication where they're where, where they're brought to site. Many bridges that are now in service are also have also been done all around the world and including also these are concrete at the bottom here. Um, so that you can see my cursor perhaps on this screen, uh, but also things like steel. So the MX3D bridge is use a wire arc additive manufacturing method with robotic steel welding to produce the bridge that's now in service. Um, and also really interesting uh, infrastructure application. So this is a large revetment wall where 3D concrete printing was combined with conventional slab casting to produce components that can be then shipped to site and assembled. Um, there's stormwater drainage being done uh, and installed using concrete printing technology where you're able to resize the chamber. There's a business actually uh, based in Switzerland that will do inspection chambers uh, to whatever size and configuration you want using the technology. Another really exciting big stuff. So this, um, this was a 10 meter high base, uh, a project between Cobod in uh, Copenhagen uh, and General Electric. So the, the problem with wind turbines is, is that you could only make uh, steel tubes so long and you can only transport steel tubes so long. So what happens if you want to put them higher in the air to get more wind speed? Well, one idea is that you can extend the base in a custom fashion by printing in situ a large base which could then be post tensioned and used as a base for supporting the wind turbine column. And this was done um, in Copenhagen. It was 10 meters tall. I was lucky enough to go and see part of this being printed. It's uh, you know quite impressive. So the applications are far and wide. They are increasing in size and scale and ambition. We did a paper with col colleagues that was published last year. So actually the data is now a couple of years out of date. but. <clears throat> Then we found about 80 uh, companies, uh, organisations worldwide offering 3D concrete printing services, patents, demonstrator applications, papers, everything is, is exponentially growing. Um, it's a really exciting space where the academic work is really running hand in hand with the developments in the commercial sector. There's a lot of venture capital going into promoting the technologies but it's really getting a foothold. And at the Constructing Excellence conference I was at earlier in the year, um, uh, 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 one of the, uh, some, I uh, forgot the gentleman's name from uh, WSP, uh, 
did a slide and they've been monitoring interesting technologies for construction. So everything from, you know, on-site LIDAR measurement to, to 3D concrete printing. And they were plotting them along the hype curve and they had concrete printing right at the right in the, the, the bottom dip before it goes into mainstream, um, mainstream use. So beyond the actual top of the hype, which is a really exciting place to be because it's the bit where we find out, you know, where the benefits are and where it's going to make some real impact. So great commercial space, but also continuing to develop and improve from a research perspective. And some of the stuff we've been doing at Loughborough is taking the geometric freedom. So we don't need the moulds. We can have shapes for free, which is not quite for free, but we've got more flexibility in what we can print. But we also have this staircasing effect on the surface, which is OK when you're doing demonstrators, one off parts. But if we want to see the technology really be competitive with cast components, so have as good a cast uh, articles with this geometric freedom uh, as value added, then I think we're in we can have a much bigger impact with the technology. So the challenge is how to how to get this precision and we've been exploring um, milling so we print an object and then before it's fully set in its hardened state while the concrete is still green we can then mill the surface relatively easily and gain much higher degrees of precision um, but in addition we can get much greater detail so uh, you'll see um, in the in the gray images a lot the bottom the fourth one in from the left this circle and sort of rebate section. You can get really crisp defined features which are at least as good as cast, um, which are very difficult to get with pure concrete printing. So these sorts of techniques, and, and there are not, these are not the only things people are using troweling to smooth surfaces, but I think there's some real advantage here where we're able then to actually explore more novel applications. So, what about resource consumption, waste and cost? This is an exotic process. Um, it's sort of high value. You know, history says that these are not necessarily maybe the cheapest, lowest cost options. You know, how does, the, how does concrete printing stack up? And, you know, what about the impact of environmental emissions? You know, I did say we've got quite high cement content stuff. You know, these are potential issues and they are indeed um these are all problems that we've got to face um, but the interesting thing about concrete printing is that we get this geometry for free so there is a real benefit to being able to produce components that require less material because we've got control over where it's placed if we can bring the uh, embodied carbon level of the materials down to a, a more normal concrete level, then we're starting to get real benefits towards some of these net zero challenges. So it breaks up that when we've got an application that we're applying our concrete printing process to, you know, issues around embodied carbon uh, durability. Um, do they last as well as um, conventional concretes? Um, how can we reduce the embodied carbon? Um, the process, you know, the process is processes are uh, varied in their maturity depending on where they are, but they are still, you know, we're still on early doors. You know, these processes have only actually been around for an absolute maximum of 17 years, which is not long. You know, they've only been, this acceleration commercially has only happened over the last perhaps six or seven years. So there's a long way to go fine tuning, learning from best practice in reducing the production efficiency, reducing waste and getting these processes uh, better. Um, and also lots of interesting challenges in design. We end up with this triangle where the properties of the material and the abilities we can do with the process give us constraints. And then the design is how we can maximize the benefits with those constraints to do new things, you know, efficiency and material production things. So these are you know, all real net challenges. There's an interesting paper for those that are interested, uh, that was recently published in a special issue of Cement and Concrete Research, which is a nice short work on uh, just discussing some of the sustainability issues to do with uh, uh, fabrication of concrete. And um, Robert Flatt and Tim did a really nice job of that. So you can check that out. 
And just to sort of uh, wrap up, I thought I would, uh, and I've already apologised to Mo if I've bent any of his uh, any of his sort of uh, uh, meanings behind this paper out of shape. I'm sure he'll pull me up on this in the in, in the Q and A if I have. But I just wanted to bring this back to sort of circularity and this idea, and sort of highlight some of the advantages that we've got. So we've got 3D concrete printing, and we've got the hybrid methods, which is concrete printing plus something else to make it a bit more precise. Um, number one. You know, we've got digitally controlled, flexible design and manufacturing and production scheduling. We've got a digital model. We've got moldless manufacture, which gives us a flexibility of design. So as long as we can capture the uh, manufacturing constraints and embody them in code, then you've got a flexible tool where your designs can be manufactured reliably, which is um, which is but you're getting the flexibility design for free, which is a really powerful thing. And because it's all digital, we've got a process that is driven digitally and we're taking people away from the actual crafting of the components. We're trying to get processes that can work more or less in, ice, you know, in an automated way. Um, but what we're having to do is control the process, control the materials. Um, but if we can, if if we can, if we can do that effectively, then we can model um, uh, the process, model the production simulation, model the part simulations, because we have to do this to generate the tool paths. Um, but if you can do production scheduling based on components, then you've got automatically a, a much better way of, of managing and optimizing production. You've got better cost controls because they become more reliable. You can measure them in a systematic way and build those into your manufacturing, into costing. But it also means that you've got a robust process that you can improve upon. You know, you've got very set ways of doing things. You can explore best practice, reducing waste, and then implement them into what is a, a constrained process. And I think all of these things have, have real great um, benefit. Now, in terms of design, I think you don't necessarily need to um, uh, print structural material. So one of the big challenges is that if you uh, the, 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 the printing produces an anisotropy in the material, um, and there's work going on here at Loughborough and elsewhere on really understanding the mechanisms behind that. Um, uh, but obviously, if you're producing reinforced material, structural material, then it's not code compliant because it's manufactured in a different way. Um, so this is a hurdle. So one of the challenges that's going on in Rylam at the moment is understanding how to how to define uh, the processes for measuring this uh, these properties better. But a very neat way around is is actually to print the formwork for structural parts. And and this this image just here is some work in in, in, in from colleagues from Laboratoire Navier in Paris, um, where Rectilinear beams are, have a lot of redundant material in them structurally, um, but obviously trying to cast, trying to create a mould that's got all of the additional mould material in to sort of avoid filling all this redundant material in is expensive. However, if you can print that, then you suddenly have control over it. Uh, and this was uh, had all of the redundant material sort of optimised. Uh, the mould was effectively 3D printed into which you can put conventional reinforcement, conventional casting. So structurally, you have a code compliant element with reduced material, which is a real benefit. Um, obviously, you do have the printed material. So there's interesting questions around whether um, the printed material can, can be responsible for cover on steel, because if it has, that can be taken into account. And also interested in not printing with concretes, but maybe clays, where you can reuse the clay for molding. Um, so there's lots of opportunities that are not just concrete, but also you can manufacture in features that are helpful. So here in the bench that we, we did at Loughborough, we actually printed in a conduit into which we were able to place steel reinforcement for post tensioning. So rather than having to cast in something that would be formed when it was cast, uh, we printed it in. So we were able to reduce the materials that were uh, having to add to structures to make them. Um, and the one on the right is something that we've been looking at um, is where we're, you know, holes for bolts, for lights, 
and actually being able to machine in conduits. So this is with the hybrid process, we're able to do the milling. Suddenly these features we can add um, have a great deal of potential for integrating functions into components. So you are not having to have parts with either very complicated pre-molding or the addition of other processes like chasing and out after, and um, you're able to incorporate it in the tooling of your automated process, which shortens the production time, reduces uncertainty between different so, uh, different trades. So there's lots of interesting benefits. And then we've been quite interested in jointing. And this is where I think it sort of tips towards this disassembly question. So if we can got better control, can we start jointing things in different ways? Can we think about how we might be able to you know, disassemble structural components, which then can mean we can reuse these things later for, 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 for other applications. And again, this is all enabled, I think, by combining the printing with the milling to get these very precise um, surfaces. Um, and materials, there's lots of ongoing work with materials, <clears throat> looking at durability, understanding the durability of printed concretes. But, you know, it needs to be as good as cast stuff. Um, being able to get more reliable processes so we're able to have less waste, waste um, you know, in production. But overall, I think the, the technology has got a lot of potential to offer. And in particularly with looking at this net zero and the circular aspects, there's a, there's a whole range of questions that can be explored. So um, I hope uh, that was interesting uh, and thank you very much and be very happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Richard, for this informative, thought-provoking presentation. And then thanks for your effort as well to try to link your work to uh, circularity and the work of our centre. Um, I think time for um, questions. I think for the moment, if you don't mind, please, if you can type in any questions for Richard in the chat. Uh, for the moment, we have one um, from Saskia talking about why is the concrete used in additive manufacturing more onboarded carbon intensive than, tip, than typical concrete? Is there a higher percentage? Yes, so um, there is. So essentially, um, whether you use um, spraying or extrusion, you are essentially pumping the concrete. So we use conventional pumping technology uh, and if you're pumping concrete you need a, a, a higher paste content to make the material uh, pumpable um, a lubricating layer um, and also there's a there's a lot of careful grading to make sure the thing actually pumps the upshot is is that you need a higher cement content to make that material pumpable which increases the embodied carbon however um so when we did it originally at Loughborough, um, that was that, that was what we did, and it's it's similar to shock creating materials. Um, but there's been lots of work undergoing reducing the cement content, reducing the overall strength of the material. Um, there's also lots of work interested in, in looking at geopolymers uh, and increasingly in calcined clays and other another 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 ways of, of of bringing down. And the other big thing is is aggregates. So. Um, Obviously, if you most of the mortars use like a worm pump, which is a you know, worm stator, so they usually have you know three, maybe four millimeter maximum aggregate size that can go through the worm pump, which is the limiting factor. If you go to a piston pump, um, you're then able to, as in convention, moving conventional concretes, then you can you have larger aggregates. And on some of the bigger pores, like uh, the cobalt systems and the stuff that Perry's been doing, they're using a twin system pump, so they can go up to I think I think eight mil, maybe ten mil aggregates. So of course, their larger proportions aggregates reduces the paste content, and so has a big impact on the embodied carbon. But all of these things are still, you know, it's still in the research. And working with industry at the same time, um, so it's th there's a lot to go. So we by all no means have the answers yet, but we're on we're on a journey where I think we'll go in a good good direction. Thank you, Richard. I think we have two more questions in the chat. Um, first one from Aruga, looking at what kind of curing methods is used after printing. Great question. Great question. So. 
Um, this is a challenge. So obviously um, what we don't want is shrinkage or significant shrinkage. Uh, we don't want cracking in the material. Um, so the mixes are designed generally to be very low shrinkage materials. They're designed very, to have very low water content. Um, uh, and there is a lot of interest again in how we cure. So when you're printing on site directly, by and large, you're printing directly in the environment. And the challenge with concrete printing over molding is that when you're molding or casting anything, three sides all but the top is effectively sealed. So you're only getting water loss from one surface. Concrete printing, it's only the bottom surface that's sealed and you're getting water loss on all sides. So it is a challenge, largely for materials. Um, but in, 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 the labs, in the labs, we um, we will generally use fairly standard methods. We would wrap an item in um, polythene. We would then coat it in wet hessian like you would do on site. So coat it in polythene and keep that humid um, while, while it's curing. But for sure, again, this is something that we, we do. Um, but there's more work to be done to make to understand the systematic procedures that we really need to embody best practice. Still lots to do. Thank you, Richard. The next one from Irene. Um, what about the social aspect of 3D printing in comparison to traditional methods? For instance, health and safety issues for worker, occupational safety, or any other social impacts? Yeah, great question. So, um, I think one of the nice things about this technology is that it brings together lots of people from lots of different disciplines. We're talking, you know, robotics experts, increasingly metrology people, you know, being able to measure the parts, um, but also concrete materials people, as well as contractors, architects, the structural engineers. It's a real melting pot. So from a from a from an industry perspective. It's, it's a really great technology to focus on because it answers all the questions we've got about digital modeling, digital information, um, automation of manufacture, um, how that fits in with the procurement process as these projects are getting bigger, you know, that, that we're getting more in, involved in how to produce bigger projects. So from, a, from, a, from, a, from our industry's perspective, I think this is all, this is all really interesting learning. From the operatives perspective, where I think the benefits are is we're taking people away from physically being engaged with the concrete material, which is a good thing. And we're looking at probably retraining people in terms of operating plant, which our manufacturing cells are basically, it's just plant and equipment. So we're able to sort of perhaps reskill people and move them away from the coal face and crafting and being in control of the material to being in control of a machine. And hopefully the benefit is they get better working conditions, um, we get better productivity out of it. So I think that's a win. In terms of health and safety of the machines, it is it is a plant question. What's interesting is, is the cobod systems, the big gantries on site are quite slow moving and they have, so you see them with the conventional sort of hard stops as you would see in, you know, hoists and tower cranes and things. So it works on that principle where people can move around. And um, when you're talking about robotics, generally they're in manufacturing cells uh, where they're protected because obviously you have additional health and safety issues with 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 robotics. Um, but again, these are all this is all learning. And at the moment, the, the tricky bit is we've sort of got a digital crafting where we've got lots of experts making the machine work because we haven't quite got all of the automation stitched together across the processes. Um, but hopefully in time. Uh, people will be able to come away from that and will be be, be distance. So yes, there are issue, different issues, um, but many positives, I think, for, on the social aspects of the technology. Thank you, Richard. So the next question from Lionel, looking at limitations. Are there any limitations on the size and scale of structures that can be 3D printed with concrete? Um, yes. And no. So yes, there are, of course there are limitations. Um, I think what's important, concrete printing is a manufacturing or in situ production technology. It has value in some aspects. It has less value 
in other aspects, just like every other construction system and every other manufacturing system we have. Um, generally with buildings, you've got a building area and a building height if you're building the walls, um, which are limited by physical size, okay? But there are some really innovative ways of, of manufacturing. So I think Cobalt, um, there's been quite a few two-story buildings built. So that's quite big. Um, in Dubai, there was a 640 meter square building printed. But there, rather than having one big gantry over the whole building, they had a mobile single column system made by Apiscor. So they would print a bit of the building, lift it up on a tower crane, put it over here, build the next bit of the building, pick it up and move it around. So again, it's not all this is concrete printing. It's about how we can apply the technology to deliver these things. In off-site manufacturing, then no, technically there isn't. If you're building off-site components, you can make as many bits as is needed to build the building in very much the same way as we do with precast at the moment. Um, so I think it's all down to where the benefit is um, and how that how those systems come together. Thank you, Richard. The next question from Fea is twofold. First one is, is the percentage of recycled materials that can be incorporated in cement and concrete limited in 3D concrete printing? The second part, are there any standards specific to this? to 3D uh, concrete printing products? Yes, great question. So um, um, people are experimenting with using recycled materials for concrete printing. Um, the challenge is, is the fact that when we mix the concrete or mortar for printing, um, it has to be pumpable or we have to be able to move it. So there are some systems that use gravity feed, uh, but it, but it, it has to slip in the gravity or be pumped along a pipe. That's a requirement number one, otherwise we can't move it. Um, and then when it's extruded, and I'll use it, I'll stay on extrusion because it's the most common method. Um, it then has to retain its shape and it has to withstand the hydrostatic pressure uh, and, and the extrusion pressures of the materials as they build up. OK, and um, it then has to become stiff enough to sustain buckling and failure in, in the wet material before it's set. So this is quite comp this is quite tricky to do. And actually, it places quite high requirements on the rheology um, and the control of the setting of the material itself. So while, yes, we can add recycled aggregates, it, it, the problem is getting those properties right. Um, so it's probably limited. I think when we start using like larger aggregates, then I, that's likely to be um, easier to, 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 to incorporate. Um, so there are no standards at the moment. Um, the current state of play is we're sort of pre-standardization. There are, there are moves to create standards, which could be good or bad. You know, we, we're on the process. But Rylam have had one technical committee uh, the, the one Mo referred to, which finished in oh, a couple of years ago now, a year ago, I can't, I, can't, I can't remember, where the community was sort of coalesced around the state of the art of the materials. And the materials are control of the wet properties and the rheology for printing and the hardened properties. So how good the stuff is once it's set. That has now developed into two five year Ryland programmes. Um, that has looked at those two streams. So one is about quality assurance of the wet properties. And the challenge there is how do you measure the rheology reliably so you get printing because it's not as easy as we want it to be. So this is all about how we do that, uh, which will build into the reliability of the manufacturing. And the other one is how do we assess printed concrete? We have we're printing lots of beads of layers on layers. OK, so it doesn't perform the same in all directions. And there's no standard methods of assessing these things. Um, so there is a terrific, you know, 150 people around the world, part of that technical committee, looking at those, which will then be the pre-standardization work that will go into understanding materials. So, but also on the materials, there's lots of the suppliers, all the big suppliers, you know, Sangaban, Lafarge, they're all producing printing mixes and working on 
lots of different material types to use. Thank you, Richard. So from standards to design method. So the next question um, from Hariga, looking at, do you perform similar concrete design or analysis methods prior to printing the structures? And do you have any other specific or do you have any other specific methods? Yeah, um, I think this is, this is the, the whole design is really interesting. So we are using essentially the tools that we have at hand to understand the structural performance of the material. The challenge is, is what we what we don't have reliably is how we assess the performance of the material to use in the models. You know, so people will have done tests in the laboratory, you know, in, in their own labs. And this is the problem because everyone's doing lots of great work, but but this hasn't come to sort of standardized methods of comparison, which is literally where we are. Um, so it's really the data. And there's a big round robin testing that's going under the Rylam committee at the moment, where are they doing the first work by standardizing test methods and letting laboratories use their printing materials and their methods to create parts for testing. So the first work and the major step is underway now to do that. But yes, FEA modeling, lots of CFD of interest of the flow. We're using the same tools that we would use for conventional design, but just applying it to unconventional materials and process. Perfect. Thank you so much, Richard. I think we're coming to the end of the session. It's we are one minute over time, but I would like to ask you the takeaway of this webinar. Looking at all your experience, what do you think the future of 3D printing will be? Say the next 10 years, 15 years, and do you envisage the 3D printing sites in the future, i.e. printing all other materials, not just concrete? Great question. So <clears throat> I think that what we'll see it are moving from largely venture capital driven demonstrators. We will see business cases develop where it's making its first commercial, you know, real commercial business inroads, right? Um, we will see increasing awareness with designers. We'll see increasing understanding of how to design for the component. So I think there will be a proliferation of concrete printed components going into our built environment. Structural, structural stuff, I think we'll see more about printing formwork and on materials mode, I think this equally could be polymers. It could be, you know, it doesn't have to be concrete molds, it's large scale. So I think there'll be, there'll, there'll be more of that. Um, um, and I think that will lead to, in time, structural or, or more standardized structural applications. But we've got to get through standards. So we are talking about we're on that journey um, and it's an interesting one to be on. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Richard, again for this really interesting presentation. Um, we learned quite a lot um, from today and then hopefully we'll have other opportunities to um, invite you for other opportunities, either webinars or workshops. 